Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Oh, God, let's open up first with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, God. We thank you for your awesome spirit, for your sweet touch. We thank you for your Holy Ghost power, God, the power that reigns inside of us, your dunamis power, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for the ability to bless your holy name, God, to be, the ability to be able to hear and speak truth and righteousness, your truth, Father God, not what we deceive as truth, Father God, what we discern as truth, but what you have called truth, which is your word, God. We thank you right now for the study of your kingdom, for the study of your lordship, Father God, that will bless us both here and now and in the age that we have yet to see. We thank you that you're coming back again for a church without a spot or a blemish, God. I thank you right now that you're dwelling inside of us. We thank you that you're not just the Lord of heavens, but you are called Emmanuel, the God with us, Father God, for you dwell in us, Father God, that you are with us at all times. Thank you for your grace and mercy that follows us all the days of our life. When we go left, it's right behind us. When we go right, it's right there, Father God. When we're in the struggle, you are right there with us. And we thank you for being a God who's uh, ever so present help in the time of trouble. I pray now that you bless this word and bless everybody who will receive it. Bless those, Father God, who don't even know why they're tuning in, Father God. But bless them with an ear to hear that you will speak something to them that will change their lives forever. I thank you for the transformational truth. And I thank you for what's going to transpire in this hour. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank God. And amen. I'm excited tonight. Oh, God, I'm excited tonight. If you can't tell already, I'm excited. I'm excited. I've been excited all day to share the word of the Lord with you. I do have a word. Uh, uh, this is called um, the Holy Week or the Passion Week, where Christ is entering into his last week about 2,000 years ago. We, 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 um, we believe to happen during this week where it, it is commemorated that we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this week, there is a trending, a streamline of Christ's life in the latter part of his, his journey on earth. The last week that he's here on earth of things that's happening day over day. And lo and behold, the only day that nothing happens or that's recorded to be believed by theologians is Wednesday. Is it is on Wednesday it's believed that nothing happened. It was it was silent. It, 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 it was it was it was peaceful. It was almost like a day of rest. But certain theologians believe that while everything was silent in the gospel and while there was no movement in Christ, while, while, while there was no apparent uh, recording of any type of, 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 of incidents occurring or events happening, that Judas was conspiring behind the scenes, that he was plotting to betray Jesus. Many believe that this is the time where Judas is, is getting his plot on. And I want to I wanna pick up today to talk about the plot of the enemy. I want to talk about uh, really the, the emphasis on uh, why this week is so important to us as believers in relationship to those who betray us. Oh, in relationship to those who manipulate us. In relationship to those who sometimes uh, misuse the gift that God has given us, the gift of life, the gift of energy, the gift of love, the gift of trust. My God, has anybody misused your trust before? Sometimes you've been betrayed in so many ways. Sometimes people betray you, don't even know they betray you. Sometimes people are, are, are really uh, antagonized. You don't even know they're antagonized. Sometimes you got irritation from people who think they're supporting when still they're strategically there to betray you. They're strategically, I'm going to say it again, there to betray you even though it's not intentional. Sometimes we think betrayal to be so intentional that we forget betrayal li literally means just to put another person in the way of danger from an opposer, in the way of danger from an enemy. It, it means literally to do something in contrary to that person's uh, safety. And sometimes we speak on things that we don't have the right to speak on that puts other people in danger because the enemy hears the words that you speak about somebody else and the power of life and death is in the tongue and you're giving him secrets about somebody else and he's using those secrets for strategies to be able to trap somebody else. Oh my God. And we don't even know sometimes we're stepping in the foots of Judas as betrayers. And I want to talk today about, about Judas because I believe that as believers we have to understand that, that we're going to be betrayed. If we don't understand we're going to be betrayed, we'll make our next decision based on our last decision. And if our last decision was a betrayal decision, we'll miss out on the blessing thinking about the betrayal. I'm going to say it again. 
We'll make our next decision based on our last decision. If our last decision was a betrayal, we'll miss out on the blessing thinking about the betrayal. We'll, we'll, we'll miss out on what God has thinking about what somebody else did. We'll, think about, we'll, we'll miss out on our next happiness thinking about our last hurt. Because we can't get over that betrayal and we don't realize that it's strategic, not just from the enemy, but from our destiny that God had to use it. We will miss out on the blessing thinking about our betrayal. And I want to talk to you today from the topic of bridges built by betrayal. My God. Bridges built by betrayal. I think sometimes we're fighting those who are building bridges for us. Because we think we're not supposed to be betrayed. And you know what God told me? Let me share what God told me. God told me, because I, I was getting frustrated by people uh, who like to criticize but don't like to do nothing uh, to help anybody else who like to always talk about what other people are doing but not doing anything in their own right, in their own mind. They're not putting forth any effort to change the, the world. They're not putting forth any effort in the kingdom. They're just on, on the sidelines. God says, if you are called, why are you fighting with Chileans? Oh, God, today. He says... He says, if you are called, if you are playing in the game, if you are on the court, if you are in the field, if you are the one in the game, if you are called to the game, why are you wasting time fighting with people on the sidelines? Why are you wasting time fighting with cheerleaders? Why are you wasting time fighting with critics? Why are you wasting time fighting with people who are not doing anything to push the kingdom forward? I'm here to tell somebody, stop wasting your time fighting with cheerleaders when you've been called to play in the game. Here we go. Matthew chapter number 26 is where you'll find my assignment for tonight. It's what I want to use as a springboard. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the verse I want to use to build from. We, we're going to build from Matthew 26, verse number 14. When you have it, type in the, in the comments, amen. Put it in there, amen. Come on here, somebody. Somebody say, I got it. I got it. Somebody shout amen. Put it in all caps with an exclamation point. My Lord, let me know you're ready. It says, then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? My God, what can I compromise? What can I negotiate? What's the price of delivering the priest? Mm. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, which is about a month wage. So from that time, from that time, from that time, from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him, my God. I want to minister today, bridges built by betrayal, okay? That's, that's kind of like my subtopic. I, I feel like the, the umbrella, the, the, the broader topic is, is the Passion Week, is how to be like Christ. Uh, um, and, and these are some just subtopics uh, that I want to minister for. Matter of fact, let me just give you this. So you can tune in on Sunday. On Sunday, I got a subtopic called The Naked Truth. Uh, you can't miss that one. Hey, tune in. That, that's just my plug right there. Uh, you don't want to miss it because I'm telling you something. Jesus has given us some revelatory uh, uh, lifestyle principles and practices that we must follow if we want to be like Jesus. I think we're getting so far away from being like Christ that we forget what he did when his betrayer became, uh, came up to him. When his betrayer showed up, when his betrayer uh, did what he needed to do in order to betray Jesus, we oftentimes think that this was an isolated event where Judas just somehow one day woke up one day and said, you know what? I ain't got nothing to do today. I'm going to eat some cereal, get some Frosted Flakes. By noon, I'm going to betray Jesus, and I'm going to get... No, it wasn't like that. It was a buildup. It, it, it was a, 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 cul a culmination of things that occurred that, that led Judas to this point. And I want to talk about that because, because those points were, were, were bridges inside the life of Christ, that Judas was trying to get uh, Christ to go down a certain bridge. See, see, the truth of the matter is bridges are the thing that connect us from one place to the other. They're the things that's built in structure that get us from one side of a thing to the other side of a thing. They're the things that we need if we want to extend our borders beyond our own little territories. We can't fly everywhere. We can't walk everywhere. We can't run everywhere. Sometimes we need bridges. Sometimes we need the things that connect from this side to this side, from this rim to this rim, from this dimension to this dimension. And the truth of the matter is your whole entire Bible is filled with bridges. Whenever you see somebody make it to their destiny, they didn't do it alone. They needed a bridge. 
They needed a bridge. Come on here. They needed a bridge. They needed, they needed something to connect them from the place they were to the place they were going. Come on here. They needed a bridge. And sometimes those bridges are built by the betrayers. Come on here, Joseph. Joseph would have never became second in charge if he didn't have a bridge built by his brothers betraying him. He needed a bridge to get him from the place he was at to the place he was going. Come on here, Moses. Moses never would have became uh, uh, the deliverer for the children of Israel if he didn't have a bridge from Pharaoh. If he didn't have the, 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 the fact that Pharaoh w w was, was the one who forgot who Joseph was that helped him and start to afflict the children of Israel, Pharaoh became a bridge that Moses needed to propel him to the next place that, he, that God wanted the children of Israel to be, to bridge through the Red Sea, to bridge in the wilderness, to get him from Egypt to the promised land. Moses needed a bridge to get him out of Egypt. Moses became a bridge to get him to the promised land. You need bridges to get to your destiny. You need bridges to get to your purpose. Stop getting upset at the plans of bridges being built by betrayers because it's getting you to your purpose. Stop getting upset at the plans of, betray of betrayers building your bridges because it's getting you to your purpose. You need a Goliath to get to your palace. Come on here, somebody. You, without Goliath, you don't never become king, David. Without Goliath, Saul never recognize who you are. Without your giants, you never see the truth of the matter of your crown. You can never get to your throne unless you fight your giants. God will put you in positions. God will put you in positions where you have to do something that's bigger than you, that's greater than you, that's stronger than you, that come against you, and you got to stand up against it. Why? Because it's not there to hurt you. It's there to build you. It's there to get you to the one place, from one place to the other. And if you run from it, you will miss your bridge because you're running from your betrayers and you're not getting to your blessings. You can't get to the palace without the pain of fighting the giants. Come on here. You can't get to the palace without the pain of being betrayed by a king. You can't get to the palace without your sons and your daughters, the people who are close to you, who are supposed to love you, who are supposed to be right there with you, sometimes coming against you. David had to go through all of that, but all of that was used as a bridge to get him to the place God wants him to be. Do you want to get to the place God has for you? Do you really want to see all God has in store for your life? Or are you content with just one side of the of the layout, one side of the of the rim, one side of the dimension, one side of the blessing, that you don't have a desire to see what's on the other side. But in order to see it, you need a bridge. You need a bridge. Come on, somebody say, I need a bridge. Somebody say, God, give me a bridge. See, bridges, bridges are built in a structured manner uh, to, to help you uh, uh, get from one place to the next. It's a route. It's a pathway. And the truth of the matter is, even though bridges go over trouble, bridges are still trouble. Bridges go over danger, but bridges are dangerous. My wife is afraid of bridges. True, I mean, uh, terrified of bridges. She is so afraid of bridges that sometimes when I want to feel her arm or hand on my muscles to grab on my arm, I go over a bridge. <laughs> sometimes I just find a bridge j j just so she can just grab on, on my muscles. Because I know she's afraid of bridges. And, and, and she's afraid, not resting, of the bridge itself, but she's more afraid of the things up under the bridge. She's more afraid of, 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 the, of, the, water, of the waters around the bridge. She's more afraid of the danger, watch this, around the bridge that can't even get on the bridge. But because the danger is in the circumference of the bridge, she thinks that the bridge in and of itself is dangerous because danger is around the bridge. See, sometimes God will put you in a situation that looks dangerous, and it looks like things that's coming against you, but the truth of the matter is, if you just stay on the bridge, huh? oh, Jesus, if you stay on the path, if you stay on the route, if you stay in the avenue he has for you, the danger that looks close to you will not come near you. The danger that looks right around you will not drown you. The danger that looks like it's coming up will not overthrow you. You cannot be afraid of things up under you that you're afraid to go over the things on top of you. There's some things that is above you that you got to travel over to get to the other side. There's some things that you got to elevate yourself in. Oh, God. There's an attitude that you got to elevate yourself. See, see, everybody's comfortable always saying, oh, I'm just going to be me. Well, who are you? Who, come on here. Who are you? I know who you was, but is that who you always going to be? Sometimes you got to elevate yourself higher so that you can go over the things that try to drown you. They try to manipulate you. They try to 
bring you into danger. See, see, there is not a scripture that says Jesus is a bridge over troubled water. But we say it because of the context of his character. Because in John chapter 5, when the man was at the water, and, and, and he says, the only way I can be healed is by the angel troubling the water. When Jesus says, if you want to be made whole, just say, I want to be made whole. And the man said, I want to be made whole. And Jesus made him whole without stepping in the water because he became a bridge over troubled water. What that means is, is that I don't need an angel to save me. I don't need another created creation to save me. I don't need anything else to save me. The water can't save me. Me stepping inside of a place can't save me. No, I got a bridge in Christ who will save me, who will take me over the troubles of water, like the Red Sea, who will bring me through danger seen and unseen. If I don't need angels. I got the angel of heaven. I got the true and living Christ. I got the only Savior. Who will be my bridge? But see, even Jesus needed a bridge. Yeah. He needed, he needed somebody to connect him to the place God was taking him. See, we all need somebody to connect us to the place God has taken us. But, but if we're not careful, we will, we will get stagnant on bridges that we're supposed to burn. Oh, God. I know, I know some people tell you not to burn bridges, but there are some bridges you're supposed to burn. Come on here. There's some bridges you're supposed to light up on fire. There's some bridges you're supposed to do away with. There's some, there's some, there's some routes in your life and avenues that take you back to a place. That when somebody hits something, when somebody triggers something, it'll take you back over that cross that bridge. And God is saying the only reason you keep going back is because you ain't burned it up. Somebody say burn it up. Oh, Jesus. Burn it up. You got to burn up some bridges. You got to light them on fire. You got to bomb them up. You got to act like you in a war and, do, and demolish those things so that when it comes a point to where you get so frustrated with some things in your life that you don't revert back to the places because you have no way to get there anyway. Come on. You have no way to get there. I burned it up. I burned it up. I'm burning. Somebody say I'm burning it up. I'm burning it up. I'm burning it up. Yeah, the place that get me back to that old attitude. I'm burning it up. The places that got me broke. I'm burning it up. The places that got me lonely. I'm burning it up. The places that got me a loss. I'm burning it up. The places that got me without anybody in my life. I'm burning them up. See, the truth of the matter is, this, this, this text is actually a symbolism of Judas' frustration with Jesus. Yeah. Judas at this point has built up frustration because, because the, the orthodox Jew, the, 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 the regular Jew during this day, thought that Jesus was the, the Messiah and the king until he didn't overthrow Rome, until he did not take on political power, until he didn't raise up physically. And, and once he didn't do what the son of David they thought should have done, once he didn't step in what, what, what they thought should have been done, once he didn't operate as a political king, they, they, they said he cannot be the Messiah. He's blasphemy now. He, 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 he's, he, he's, talking, he's talking against uh, God. If you, if you notice, when they, when they came against Jesus and they started bringing accusations with him, Jesus said, I, I've been saying this. Ever since I've been here, uh, what, what lie have I told? When he was brought before the Sanhedrin, uh, San, San, Sanhedrin Council, and they start to bring accusations, Jesus, Jesus said, well, watch why you hit me. What, what truth, I mean, what lie did I speak? I've been saying these things. I've been speaking the same thing every day. It wasn't now until you built up a frustration that you don't see what you want to see. And now that you don't see that what you want to see, you try to find somebody else to follow. And I'm afraid that in this generation, when we don't see what we want to see in God, we start to find other things to follow. We start to find other idols to look after. We start to find other treasures to seek after because God is not moving the way we want him to. Because he's not stepping in like we want him to. Because he's not doing the things we're looking for and we're trying to find other kings. But the truth of the matter is, he's the only king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of glory. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord almighty strong in battle. He is the king. Whether he's the king that you want him to be or not, he's the rightful king because he knows what you need and not necessarily what you want. He don't give it to you. And, and, and Judas, Judas was upset because Jesus didn't get him what he wanted because Judas always was trying to build bridges. For Jesus to cross over to become a political king. He was trying to build bridges for Jesus really to, to, to do something beyond just the spiritual things that Jesus was doing. How do I know that? Because right before this text, mm -hmm. Jesus is in Bethany. Mm -hmm. He's in Bethany uh, uh, at his peep's house 
you know, his peeps, uh, Martha, Mary, and, and, and Lazarus. And, and, and all four Gospels record this particular event, which means it's something you ought to pay attention to. Anytime all four Gospels record a specific event, it's something you want to focus on. All four Gospels do not record everything in your Bible. They have different perspectives of everything. But there are certain events um, that, that are really uh, uh, um, important and key items that you should always pay attention to. And this is one of those where, where, where uh, Mary comes in with an alabaster box with a, with a flask of oil that's, that's about a year worth of wages. And she breaks that oil. She begins to anoint Jesus. And, and matter of fact, in John chapter 12, let me read to you what happened. John chapter 12, verse number 3 says, Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spignard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Watch Judas. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had money box, and he used to take he used to take what was put in it. He was taking it consistently. But Jesus said, let her alone, boy. He says, she has kept this for my, excuse me, for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. This is, this is Jesus making Judas frustrated because at this point, Jesus was like, I'm now going to die. I'm going to leave. And Judas like, I'm tired of this. I'm, 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 I'm frustrated. I, I, I've tried. I, I, I've watched you for three and a half years. You ain't done what I wanted you to do. Now it's time for me to try to make some money. If you don't want to put any money in the treasury box, let me go to somebody else and see what it costs me to betray you. But, but, but before I betray you, let me try to help you build this last bridge before I betray you, this last bridge. What's this last bridge? Let me tell you how this woman messed up. Let me tell you how this woman should have used this money to, 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 to put uh, in the treasury box so I could have got me a little dib of it and we could have gave, quote unquote, some to the poor. Not that I really wanted to give some to the poor, but I wanted you, Jesus, to rebuke her. I wanted you, watch this, to walk over the bridge of the betrayal that I was trying to set for you. I wanted you to connect the treasure in earth with the treasure in heaven. See, what I love about Jesus, come on here, is that he gave the, the, the greatest responsibility we call in the earth, he gave it to his enemy. He let Judas become the treasurer overseer. He let Judas own the treasury, and we consider that as one of the greatest tasks in, the, in our whole entire earth, the, the very treasures that we have. Oh, no, you're not supposed to let the enemy have it. You're not supposed to give it to this person. But Jesus gave it to his enemy, and I have to ask God. I said, God, why would Jesus let Judas, out of all the jobs he had to give away, all the occupations, all the things he could have put Judas to do, why would he put Judas in charge of the treasury? And he says, because Jesus never wanted to, uh, to trust uh, himself with the treasure in earth when he had the treasure in heaven. And he always wanted to make sure that he kept himself in humility to not put his trust inside of the treasure on earth, but to put his trust inside of the treasure of heaven because if he ever puts his trust in the treasury on earth, then Judas can build a bridge of his betrayal that when he betrays his treasure, then Jesus will always remember that the next time somebody give him treasure, he can't trust them because the last betrayer betrayed my treasure. Now the next betrayer betrays my treasure. That's what happened when you give your treasure to men on earth. That's what happened when you let people who you trust uh, with your treasures and they betray you. You start to build bridges of why you can't trust nobody else because you gave your treasure to the wrong one. Give your treasure to the enemy on earth so that God can have your treasure in heaven. Oh God, say it again reverend. Give your treasure to the enemy on earth so that God can have your treasure in heaven. Your enemy should dictate your giving. Your enemy should dictate your sacrifice because your Bible says that your God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And if you want to be just like your father in heaven, you got to start treating your enemies with the love you treat your friends with. You got to start treating me your enemies with that treasure thing. That, that, that treasure thing that you hold close to, give it to your enemy. Why? Because the Bible says that you heap burning coals on their heads when you begin to give them things that they don't, they don't, they, they, excuse me, that they know they don't deserve. You heap burning coals. You become like your daddy. But the problem we have is we let our betrayer build bridges to our treasures so that when they betray us, we now have a bridge built so the next time somebody even get close to betraying us, we run across that bridge. Oh, I remember when. 
Oh, I, I can't trust you with my treasure. Oh, oh, oh I, can't, I, can't give it, I can't give it to you because the last person I gave it to, they, they betrayed me. And the truth of the matter is, if you make your destiny decision based off your history, you will miss your blessing. If you make your destiny decision based off your history, you will miss your blessing. Why? Because your destiny don't always look like your history. The problem within the, your, your context of the New Testament is the reason why they said Jesus was not the king is because they kept looking back at the history. And God is trying to build new bridges to places you've never been before. But if you keep looking back what he did, you'll never know what he can do. So, so if you only think God can do what he did, then you, you won't allow God to build a new bridge to a new place. And you will always revert back to the old bridges because you said, based off my history, my destiny has to look like this, which means I can't get nothing better than that. I'm missing my new blessings because of my old burdens. The old betrayals will cause you to miss your new blessings. Old betrayals will cause you to miss your new blessings. You got to ask yourself, before you cross that bridge, is this bridge worth the benefit of my blessing that I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this route back of my old betrayal? It, it, it's, 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 it's this benefit of me going across the bridge, of me crossing over, when, when this person defies my trust and I run back to not trusting nobody, is that benefit worth my next blessing? It, 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 is it beneficial? It's so much for me to, to revert back when they defy my trust and when they when they defy the things that I give them, the precious things, the secret things, the things that nobody knows about, the treasures that I have. When they defy me, do I revert or do I let God build a new bridge? See, see, oftentimes we look at the rejection of people as the rejection of God. And the truth of the matter is, the rejection of Jesus was actually his reward. The fact that Judas rejected him rewarded him. Come on here. The fact that Judas rejected him was actually his reward. In World War II, in World War II, uh, uh, it, it was believed that a man by the name of Donald Bailey was a significant uh, 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 person to help win that war. Why was he significant? Because uh, uh, Winston Churchill had, had had built some massive tanks, some real big tanks that's never been. They called the deadly tank, the most deadliest tank they said was built between uh, 1940 and 1945 during the, during World War II. But the problem is with these tanks, they couldn't cross over the bridges because the bridges were made of wood, and, and, and they would have broken through, and, and the bridges wasn't strong enough. So Donald Bailey he came up with a structure that that that, that, that was able to hold uh, a certain amount of weight. But it was light enough to be uh, moved and built with human hands because you, you got to remember back in this day, that's not technology. We don't have all of the things we have uh, in, in this day and age. We didn't have all of the massive technology. And then it's a war, so they have to build it at night where men have to carry it. So you have to find something so light that men can carry but so strong that it can carry the weight. And when Donald Bailey uh, uh, structured it, he was the architect of these, of these bridges, and, and he began to uh, teach me how to build these bridges. That's when the tanks were able to cross over into the enemy's territory. Why? Because the new bridges they built was able to carry the weight of the, of the work they were trying to do to win the war. I said the new bridges that was built was able to carry the weight uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the work they were trying to do to win the war. See, there is some work that God is trying to do to help you win your war, but you got to be able to build some new bridges that can carry your weight. You can't keep crossing these old bridges because these old bridges can't carry your weight to your new work. And your new work requires you to build a new bridge. And if you don't build a new bridge, then you'll let your, your new blessings be, be reverted back to your old betrayals, and it will sink in the sand. And whenever you try to bring new work inside of old, old, old bridges, you lose your wars. Donald Bailey understood that. They, they understood that in World War II. Do you understand that God wants to build bridges, but sometimes he'll use your betrayal. Sometimes he'll use Judas, but you got to know which bridge is to cross. See, Judas, Jesus couldn't cross this bridge because this wasn't the bridge to his destiny. So, so, so in, in the next chapter, they're at dinner at the Last Supper, and, and, and Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all start asking, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? And it finally gets around to Judas, and Judas said, is it I? He says, you have said it. You dog go right as you, boy. And, and, he, and he says, whoever, whoever I, I dip this morsel of bread and hand it to is the one who will betray me. So, so understand this. Whenever someone dipped a morsel of bread and handed it to somebody, 
it was actually given to the guest of honor in the house. Why? Because the dipping of the bread is, is, is the first uh, uh, suction or the first uh, um, luxury piece of the bread given to the greatest person of honor saying, you get the first deal. That's, that, that's what you say in the house. That's what we say now. You get the first deal. The person we honor, you go first. That's what the, the dipping of the morsel of bread means. The dipping of the morsel of bread was an indication that this was the guest of honor. So when he, he gave him the bread, he says, you do quickly what, what you called to do. That's why they thought he was going to get money. They didn't think nothing of it because not, not because the Jesus gave him the bread as a, 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 as a place of, of antagonism or a, a, a place of accusation to say, you're my accuser. No, he gave it to him as a great honor. Why? Because the Bible says that God will make make tables in the presence of your enemy. So when he gave him the bread, what he was saying was, you're going to bless me more than anybody else at this table. Why? Because you're going to be the person that propelled me to the bridge that I need to get to. If I don't if I don't honor you right now, you won't honor me later because I know who my father is and I know what I need to do. And I need you to be able to be triggered by my bread. See, the bread triggered Judas to be able to go and, and, and betray Jesus. There are certain bridges that are your triggers, but you got to make sure it's not built by your betrayals. When God is trying to trigger you to do something, you got to make sure that you get on his bridge and not your last bridge. The trigger, you know, that trigger that, that when they say that word, it triggers something in you. That trigger when they when you get that smell, it triggers something in you. That trigger when you get that taste of that morsel of bread, but it really ain't bread. It reminds you of something. That trigger that brings back the, your, your, your memory of the old things you used to do. You got to make sure you burn that bridge. Why? Because your enemy will always try to build bridges with your triggers. It is the building of the triggers that bridges you to your temptations. It is the building of the triggers that bridges you to your temptations. See, you should never ask God to get you out of a test that you haven't learned your trigger in. If you haven't learned what triggered you to get in that test, don't ask God to get you out of that test. Figure out what's triggering you to get back in that test. Because if you don't know what's triggering you to get in that test, guess what's going to happen? It's going to trigger you again. And it's going to trigger you again. And it's going to trigger you again. And you find yourself going in cycles. And you find yourself going in circles. And you find yourself going to, to and fro over the same bridge. Why? Because you haven't found the trigger for the test. You cannot pass a test you don't show up for. So you got to be present. You got to be there. You got to know. You can't gloss over this test. Now stop trying to forget about the test and learn from the test. What triggered me? What bridge triggered me to get back to the place of my betrayers and not the place of my blessing? Because God has a trigger. God will use your enemy as a trigger to tick you off just to see if you're ready for the next place. Oh, God, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, when Jesus gave Judas the bread, what Jesus was saying was, I now, I'm now ready for you to build a bridge, not to, my, not, not to my burdens, but to my blessings. I'm now ready for you to build a bridge. Why? Because I've been able to feed my enemies. So if you can feed your enemies, then you can, you, then you can be ready for the next place in your life. Matter of fact, let me put it to you this way. Whenever you are able to feed those who try to pull you down, you're ready to go up. Oh, God, I'll say it again. Whenever you feed those who, who are trying to pull you down, you're ready to go up. So you're not ready to go up until you bless those, not who's beneath you, not who you like, not who you love, not who's close to you. No. People who pull you down, when you say, I'm going to pray for you, when you say, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm make sure that God uh, brings some peace to your house, I'm going to do all I can to help, to help you get stable and on your feet, even though I know you're trying to pull me down, I'm going to bless you. That's when you're ready to go up. See, Jesus couldn't step into resurrection until he fed the person who was trying to bring a deception. Oh, God. He wasn't ready for resurrection until he fed his deceptors. Until, the, until he fed the person who tried to bring his deception. What are you doing to what are you doing when you find out the deceivers in your life? Do you feed them? Or do you flag them? <laughs> do you feed them, feed them or do you flag them in your life? Can't trust them. Can't trust this group. Can't trust these people. All light skinned people, they. I know, you, I know you're a good preacher, but you light-skinned. Check. You wear glasses. I flag you because I haven't fed you, so therefore I can't go to the next place God has. For me. See, Jesus wasn't ready to go to that next place until he fed the person who was trying to betray him. 
See, he couldn't cross the bridge of the trigger. He couldn't cross the bridge of the treasure. And, and, and when Judas finally comes into the garden in Luke 22 and, and, and Matthew uh, 26, and, and, Ju and Judas finally gets, watch this, his opportunity that he's been seeking. He's been, the Bible says he's been seeking an opportunity. He's been looking. That means he's been focusing on the opportunity. He's been paying attention to an opportunity. He's, he's been trying to find a way to bring him down. There are certain people that are just looking for opportunities to bring you down. They're plotting against you. And Judas was looking for an opportunity. But watch this. The Bible says that no man taketh my life. This is what Jesus said. No man taketh my life, but I lay it down. So when Jesus gave him the bread, what he was saying was, watch this. You didn't trigger me, but I triggered you. So therefore, watch this. The bridge that I want you to build now is the bridge of time. Ah, I'm ready to cross over the bridge of time. Why? Because it's time for me to go back to my father. So you can betray me now. Why? Because your betrayal is nothing more than the validation that I'm right on time. So whenever your enemy starts to betray you, you got to know that your blessings are right on. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, whenever God allows your enemy to get close enough to betray you, when he gets close enough to kiss you, when he gets so close that you can't help but trust him, and then that trust turns into a, a deception, you can't get mad, baby. You got to understand that it was in the time in which God wanted for you to build a bridge over a place that nobody else can build a bridge over. Why? Because betrayal can only happen by the person you trust. If you don't trust them, they can't betray them. So there has to come a time for you to build up trust. And then God says, I'm going to trigger them. Why? To build a bridge of the time that gets you over. What, what is the time getting you over to? It's getting you over to your place of triumph. That's the last bridge that Jesus said, I need you to build. I need you to go from the time it's time for me to die up until my triumph. Why? Because Judas, if you never build a bridge to my cross, I'd never get to my crown. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You need your Judas to build a bridge to your cross. Because without your cross, you can't get your crown. So you got to find your Judases. Why? Because they're the only ones who can build the bridge when it's time for you to die. Everybody else wants you to stay alive. But it's your Judas that's going to say, I want this person to die. Now I'm going to put, watch this, dirt on top of them. I'm going to talk about them. I'm going to bring up their past. I'm going to talk about how low they got. I'm just packing them with dirt. And I'm just burying them. Yeah, I'm going to go and deceive them. Why? Not because they're dead, but because they're planted. See, the person and you call a sinner, God calls a sower. Judas wasn't a sinner, baby. He was sowing Jesus. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it shall not produce much fruit. But if it dies, it shall produce plenty of fruit. So when Judas came along, Judas wasn't the sinner. He was the sower. Nobody else would put him in the ground. Nobody else would take him to the cross. Nobody else would put the dirt on him. Everybody else loved him. But he had to find somebody to sow him. Because unless you find somebody to sow it, you can't grow it. So I need somebody to put me in the dirt. I need somebody to bury me alive. I need somebody to put some dirt on top of me. Talk about me. Allow on me. Cheat against me. Do what you want to do. Why? Because all you're doing is helping me get to a place where God can bring me up from. If you don't pack me down with dirt, God can't res uh, resurrect me to my destiny. I need that dirt on me so I can have a destiny that comes forth in me. Oh, God. It's the Judas that you get mad at as a sinner. That you said he made a mistake, she made a mistake, and you're picking your next, you're picking your next mate off your last mistake. Oh, he ain't gonna do me like he did me. He ain't gonna do me like he did me. You're right, they're gonna do you worse. They're gonna, they're gonna betray you. See, I'm afraid of people who don't admit their own mistakes. I'm afraid if, if I have a person in my life who never says they made a mistake, then I know I made a mistake. Because you shouldn't be in my life. That's the truth. Because we all, we all, the Bible says that when, when your brother sins against you, not if, when, we all make, make mistakes. We all pack some dirt sometimes on others. We all do things that, that unconsciously we don't even know that may, have, may offend somebody else. And if, if you don't ever understand that the person who's packing dirt on you is not there to watch this, it's not there to kill you because they can't kill you. They're there to release you. Then you'll miss your reward by fighting, for, by fighting the person who rejected you. You're fighting rejection when rejection is the ejection to your destination. Come on here. The rejection is the thing that ejected him out. 
it, without Judas' rejection, he never is able to get ejected from the grave. Oh, can I help you understand? This? this is my last point. So, 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 so bridges are being built, but Jesus knows which one to cross because all these other bridges don't take me to my destiny. So, so she has to give me oil. Judas, you trying to you trying to get me to put my my my, my trust inside of treasure? I'm not gonna do it. You trying to get me to trust inside of triggers? I'm not gonna do it. You trying to get me to trust inside of your timing? It's best on my timing. I'm not gonna do it because I need this bridge to my triumph. Watch this. My triumph is indicated by you building a bridge that connects me to my cross. So now you got to betray me with a kiss. See, when you study the word kiss in the Bible, you get something called first mention. And, and the first time it's mentioned in the Bible is when, uh, is, is when Isaac calls Jacob to give him a kiss because Jacob was posing as Esau. He was trying to trick his daddy to get the blessing. And, Jacob, and Isaac was like, you, you really don't sound like my oldest son. Come here and give me a kiss. And the Bible says that when he gave him a kiss, he smelled him because it, it was giving off a sin of identity. That's what kisses come in. Kisses is not just endurement or, or intimacy. No, it's about identity. That's why the Bible says greet your, greet your brother with a holy kiss. Whenever somebody enters into a house, you're supposed to give them a kiss. Uh, in the Bible, when, when, when Jesus was entering into uh, uh, one of um, the Pharisees' house, his name was Simon, Simon didn't give him a kiss, and Jesus called him out on it. He says, this woman has not stopped kissing my feet, and you ain't even offered me a kiss, because the kiss is supposed to indicate that you know who I am, and you have allowed me into your house. It's an indication of kindred. Uh, uh, you're my kid, you're my family. You're in the dwelling place. When I kiss you, I give you a step of approval that you can dwell where I dwell, that you can be where I be, that, that you can be in, in my presence and you can dwell in my house. So the kiss was a step of approval to the place where I considered my own. So when Judas kissed Jesus, what he really was giving him wasn't a betrayal kiss. Ah! He was really giving him an approval kiss. Oh, See, without the kiss of Judas, Jesus probably couldn't go to hell and say, I have to wait to be in your house. Why? Because of your servant who gave me this kiss. He gave me the right to come inside of your house. He gave me this step of approval. And because he kissed me, because I let him close enough, because I let him come into my close proximity and I let him in my dwelling place, he let me in his. So now I got a right to come in hell, not because of my own sin, but because of the sin of Judas. And I can snatch the keys because of the kiss. So you missing your keys because of who you want to kiss you, because of who you want to get close to you, because you keep worrying about people trying to defy you. When the truth of the matter is, it's those kisses that get you your keys to your next place that God has for you. I need you to kiss me. I need you to get close to me. I need the people that's close to me to defy me so that God can take me to my destiny. Oh, Jesus, help me, Holy Ghost. It's this kiss that I got that gave me the right to come get my kids from your place. It's the kiss that I got ah, that gave me the keys to open the door to your kingdom. It's this kiss I got that gave me the ability to walk in darkness when there's no darkness inside of me. Ah, it's the kiss. It's the kiss. I thank you, Judas, for building a bridge because without your bridge, I will never be able to save my saints. Oh, you built the bridge for me. You built the bridge for me. And because you built the bridge, Jesus said I became a bridge. Ah. I became a bridge over troubled water for my children. I became a bridge for my father to be connected with his children. I became a bridge uh, as an advocate. I became a bridge as a kinsman redeemer. I became a bridge to restore uh, the lost. I became a bridge to bring the children back to the father. I became a bridge to bring peace back to the house. I became a bridge to bring joy back to your soul. I became a bridge to bring heaven back to earth. I became a bridge to bring the kingdom back on earth. I am a bridge. Oh. Because Judas was my bridge. And without Judas building his bridge, Jesus couldn't build his bridge. It is, it is the bridge that connected Jesus to his cross that connected him to his crown. Without, without Judas' bridge, Jesus, Jesus only stays on the borders of earth. He can't step into another realm. He can't step into another dimension. He can't go no higher. He can't do nothing greater. He only has to stay here. He says, but I got more in store for me. There is more than the eyes can see. I got more to do 
And I can't say, do you have more to do than to be only where you've been? Do you have more to do than, than to conquer what you've only conquered? Do you have more to do than to go beyond the borders and the boundaries that you've went? Can you extend your travel plans? Can God take you beyond your limitations? Can he show you some new things? Can he do something that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered to the heart? Can he build a new bridge for your blessings? Oh! Can he build a new bridge for your blessings? Can you stop relating your new blessings to your old betrayals? Jesus was there to build a bridge. He's the only one who can build it. He's the only one that can see Christ to go to the cross. Christ gave him the opportunity to do it. Christ gave him the opportunity to build the bridge. It is the places that you're going that requires you to deal with the pain of where you came from. It is the places you're going it is the places you're going that requires you to deal with the pain that you came from. Stop looking at your betrayals as accusing. Start looking at them as approval. They, they are approving your next place. They are approving your next destiny. They're approving your crown. And the way they approve your crown is by accusing you on the cross. By sacrificing you, making you the, the, the scapegoat, putting you down, counting you out, saying she'll never change, she'll never be different. We all got desires. We all have temptations. We all have triggers. What makes us look like our father when we nail those things to the cross? Have you made decisions based on your last betrayal? Is, is, is the place you're in now, is the relationship you're in now based on the last person who betrayed you? You don't even really bond with this person, but you just don't want to be betrayed because they're the last person. I'm here to tell you that your betrayal was a bridge to your blessing. It's needed. And it's needed by those who are close to you. thank you for your time today. I thank you for your ear. Most importantly, I thank you for your heart. My prayer that the people of God will be children of God and will live 